we speak this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. At this time of the year, many eyes are, if not directly, indirectly, turned toward this gift, and we want to, especially today, think about your great love in giving us your Son. May we understand more fully just how great that gift was. And may it sink deep into our hearts today that we can love you more and show that love to others because we have come to know your Son who has life. And we thank you and pray this in his name. Amen. Now I'm ready. <laughs> unto us is born a son, a child, and unto us is given a son. He, unto us a son is given. I finally got it right. Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verse 6, is where those words come from. And as I was saying, uh, this time of year, uh, we approach... Uh, just after Thanksgiving, it doesn't take but minutes uh, after Thanksgiving, and you'll start noticing streets and front yards and stores are becoming decorated with a strange mixture of snowmen and wise men, elves and angels, Slaves and mangers. The woman fled into the wilderness, but the dragon cast out of his mouth a flood of commercialism and advertisements and, uh, to obscure the truth about God's Son. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to have you open them today, and we're going to look at quite a number of texts because even the religious world has some strange confusion about the Son of God. In spite of the fact that the Bible plainly says, and you'll see it on billboards and bumper stickers, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son and Unto us a son is given. It's amazing how many deny the Son of God came from heaven uh, as the greatest gift that the Father could give. Let's first turn to John's first epistle. Not the book of John, not the gospel of John, but John, 1 John, which is after 2 Peter. <coughs> 1 John, chapter 4, and verse 9. What is the demonstration of God's love? Now, we just read John 3.16. For God so loved the world. How much did he love the world? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And this is an echo of that, but a little more information. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Now we learn a, a couple of things from this verse. What did God send into the world? I should have said who. <laughs> he sent his son. His what? Begotten his begotten son. And when was he begotten? 
before or after he was sent into the world? Before. According to the verse, he sent his begotten son into the world. Well, there's more verses. Paul repeats this as well in Galatians. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. You're familiar with this verse. When the fullness of time was come. Probably already memorized this one. God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. He sent forth his son. And in Hebrews, we're all hovering around this part of the Bible here. In Hebrews chapter 1 and in verse 6, similar words are said here. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, And again, when he, who's he? The father, right? Right before, I will be unto him a father, and he shall be unto me a son. And again, he, he bringeth in the first begotten into the world. God the Father brought the first begotten into the world when? When he sent his son into the world. And he gave his only begotten son. Well, in verse 5. In verse 5, yes. Talking to the angels. When at any time, you are my son, this day have I begotten thee. He's speaking to the angels, that's right. Uh, the first begotten was brought in when the only begotten Son was sent into the world, and God sent forth his Son. Unto us a Son is given. It was R.F. Cottrell who said, if God gave his Son, then I believe he had a Son to give. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 1. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10 while we're here. And uh, verse 5. When he comes into the world, who's, who's he? It's the Son. When he comes into the world, he says, and now he's quoting Psalm chapter 40. Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body have you prepared for me, hast thou prepared for me. Now, if you look up Psalm chapter 40, and that's verse uh, 6, in the Old Testament, in the King James Version, it will say that uh, sacrifice and offering thou did, you did not want, but my ear have you opened. And many commentaries would say, well, you have to have a body to have an ear. So, I mean, it's kind of one and the same. But it's, uh, it's more than that. There's also, some has seen in this reflection, a, an allusion to the law of the Hebrew slave. Are you familiar with that? It's the first extra commandment, the first statute that's given after the Ten Commandments. It's Exodus 21. And in Exodus 20, we have the Ten Commandments. Exodus 21 is the beginning of the statutes. And the very first one is the law of the Hebrew slave, which says that a Hebrew slave must serve for six years, and in the seventh year, he goes out free for nothing. But... If during those six years of serving his master, he has found a wife and has children, and he says, I don't want to go out without my family. He says, I want to stay with them. Then his master shall take him to the doorpost and shall bore his ear through with an awl. That's the early form of ear piercing. They didn't have those fancy little things, whatever they use. Uh, they took him to the door and bang, put a hole through the ear, put a ring in there to indicate that he is a love slave. And it says he shall serve his master and stay with his family forever. 
Now, this is what Jesus did. When he came to this earth to rescue his family, he didn't just serve for seven, six years and go home. He could have, I guess, at the end said, that's it. I'm not going to go through with this. No one seems to love me. I don't have hardly any. Everyone's abandoned me, especially at the cross. But he, he was pierced not only in his ears, but his hands, his feet, his side, his brow. A love slave. And he says, I'm going to be united with my family forever. Which is what I think Ellen White is referring to when she says that he is one with the race he came to save for eternity. One with those he came to save. Well, he has taken our humanity with him into heaven, right? We have one mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the man... Christ Jesus, his humanity is the link that binds heaven and earth. Right? He covered his divinity with our humanity. You know all those phrases. Well, he came into the world, it says right here. When, uh, when he cometh into the world, he says, a body you have prepared for me. In the Aramaic Bible, I looked this up. I was looking at all these parallel versions. You know, you can go on the internet and you look for a verse, and they'll show you all these other translations. And there was one that said the Aramaic Bible in English, translated. It says, "You have clothed me with a body." Isn't that isn't that the way Ellen White expressed it? He clothed his humanity, his divinity, with humanity. <laughs> Get this straight. He clothed his divinity with humanity. There's another verse here. And now, oh, let's read on No, no before I go. Verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. When he comes into the world, he says, lo, I come. In the volume of the book is written of me to do thy will, O God. Haggai. Now we're going to go back to another book that starts with the letter H, but it's in the Old Testament. And Haggai, it's not Haggai. Why do I always say Haggai? Because I've heard that ever since I was a child. A lot of people still pronounce it that way, but it looks like it's spelled Haggai. <laughs> I think that's it's where... It's Haggai. Haggai. Let's, let's say it right, not Hag. Hog. Okay, Haggai. And in chapter 2, verse 7, he's famous... Uh, this is the source of where the desire of ages, the title of the book, Desire of Ages, comes from this verse. Verse 7, And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory. Well, he's talking about the temple there that they were building. After they came back from Babylon, been in Babylon for 70 years. Now they're back and they're going to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, the desire of all nations is going to come to this building. And what else? Verse 9, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In this place will I give peace. Because the Prince of Peace is going to be there. Who's the desire of all nations? Jesus says, Lo, I come. I come. He's going to come into this world because the Father sent him. He sent his Son into the world. And over and over in uh, particularly the book, the Gospel of John, Jesus says, Him that sent me. You know, he talks about the Father that sent me. He was sent, and he came. John 12, uh, verse 46, 47, Jesus is speaking about this. John chapter 12. 
he says in verse, verse 46, He that seeth me seeth him that sent me. There's one of the examples. Verse 46. What? 12. 12. Chapter 12, verse 46. I started, with four, I started with 45. I was getting a running start. 46. I am come a light into the world. So he came into the world as the Son of God. The Father sent his Son into this world. And he says, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words, verse 47, and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now he said this also a few chapters earlier in chapter 3 to Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus came at night, didn't want anybody to see him, he had this secret meeting with Jesus. Chapter 3, and right after Jesus told Nicodemus, about the, God, the Father's love that he so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into the world. He gave his Son. In verse 17 he says, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world. That's what Jesus just said. But that the world through him might be saved. Jesus back here in chapter 12 says, I have not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So he came to save. That's why the Father sent him. I hate to jump all over the place, but I'm trying to follow a theme here. And back in 1 John chapter 4, I just thought of this. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, in verse 14, we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He sent his son into the world to save the world. That's why his name is Jesus, Savior, for he shall save his people from their sins. And 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Father sent His Son into the world to be the Savior of the world. He sent His Son to save the world. He sent Jesus into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. If we look at Jesus, we see in him the Father. And we look at ourselves, we can say with Paul, I am chief of sinners. Is there any good thing in us? <laughs> no. But when Jesus comes and abides in us, then the righteousness of God becomes our righteousness. As he clothed him, his divinity with hu humanity, he clothes our humanity with his perfect righteous character. Malachi 3 verse 1. We're talking about coming into the world. Malachi is the last, verse, uh, last chapter in the Old Testament. Last book and the last chapter of the last book in the Old Testament is what we're going to look at. Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Now this has lots of meanings. Jesus suddenly comes to the temple. And in 1844, this had meaning because he suddenly came to the most holy place. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, keeping their flock by night, they announced that the Lord had suddenly come to his temple, his body temple. 
You remember Jesus referred to his body as a temple when he was speaking to the um, Pharisees and scribes in John chapter 2. And he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he, John says parenthetically, and um, John chapter 2, verse 21, he spoke of the temple of his body. So in another sense, he came to his temple. A body thou hast prepared for me. I come, lo, I come. It is written in the law, in the book. John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own. And his own received him not. He came to this world to save the world. He came to his people in the world. And they received him not. John 16, 27, 28. Now we're going to look at where he came from. We've, we've seen that he came to this world. The Father sent him. And he came to his own. Where did he come from? John uh, chapter 16, verse 27. For the Father himself loves you. Well, for. This is because. It's kind of in the middle of the sentence. And then, in that day you will ask my name and I will have to say that I will pray to the Father. For the Father himself loves you. I don't have to convince him to answer your requests, to answer your prayers. He already loves you. And for, where am I here? That I pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. So where did the sun come from? Where do suns come from, by the way? Let's ask a general question. From fathers. Now, in our human way of thinking, things operate differently here. But in the divine, econ in the divine way of thinking, it, there is a difference. But the sun came from the father. Like... And this is, there's an example given to us. Uh, I think I'm going to jump too far ahead if I do, do it now. Let's, uh, let's work up into it here. And I am come into the world. So it's this coming into the world. He's come suddenly into his temple, his body temple, but he came from the Father. And out of the, the side of the Father, the bosom of the Father, right? He is in the bosom of the Father, first, in John chapter 1, verse 18. He who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him. In heaven, the Son of God, being in the form of God. Now, where is that from? You know that verse? Yeah, it's Paul. <laughs> Which Paul? Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, and then it, and that tells us who he's talking about. He's talking about Jesus. And then verse 6, who, this is Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Why is he equal with God? Who, who is God, by the way? His father, he is equal with his father because he is in, he says it right here, he's in the form of God. The Jews, you remember, uh, said they made the same conclusion. Uh, when he healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day, 
And uh, they wanted to stone him. And Jesus says, look, my father has worked until now, and I work. And they said, not only have you broken the Sabbath, but you've blasphemed because now you have made yourself equal with God because you say that God is your father. So the equality, the divine equality, is demonstrated in these two verses, that he is in the form of God because God is his father. The son who comes forth from his father has his father's form, his father's nature. He has to have. You come out of the father, you've got to have what the father has. That's where you came from. He's your source. You have what he has. But a different person. That's right. That's why he could pray to his father. He's not praying to himself. <laughs> um, Jesus prayed that we might be one as he and his father are one. Now, we aren't the same person, but he wants us to be one. One in purpose, one in character, one in, because we have received his character, his purpose, his mind. Let the mind of Christ be in you. So being in the form of God... He emptied himself, humbled himself, and took on the form of a servant. This form, uh, he, he was God in nature, and he took on the nature of man. The only being in all the universe who has both divine and human natures. Only one. Being in the form of God, unto us a son is given. A divine son of God came forth from the Father, came out of God, in the form of God. There's a text in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, and there was a um, preacher back in the 1950s who, I haven't seen too many people refer to this, but he did, his uh, name was French, Elder French. He taught. He was a teacher also. And he commented on this verse. It's uh, Isaiah 43, verse 10. He talks about here, my servant which I have chosen. Now some people think that this is Israel. And he does say that Israel is his servant. But this is, a, this is referring to the servant which he has chosen back in chapter 42. If you look just the previous chapter, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, my, whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. And all these have little stars by them in my, in my Bible. They're all prophetic verses talking about Jesus. And it goes on, some of these are quoted in the New Testament. He shall not cry, shall not raise up his voice in the streets. And he shall not bruise a reed or uh, quench a smoking flax. Yeah. That's quoted in Matthew. Was he referring to Israel too? Yeah. Yes. Sure. He, he, wants them, he wants us to be like Jesus. Jesus. But he is the ultimate servant that does the will of his Father. And we are to follow, and he is our great example. And so in verse 10, he says, uh, and my servant which I have chosen, and now you might understand that I am he, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. But the Son is in the form of God. The only one in all the universe who came out of God, who has the nature of his Father. He is the only begotten Son of God. And just as Eve, now I thought maybe I'll give you this, we have the Father. Oh boy, here we have this. This is the same as we had for Sabbath school, isn't it? And the Son. We have a text, and I didn't put this in here, but you're familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 
<clears throat> it says that the head of the man, a head of the woman is the man. Let's get that right. Who is the man? <laughs> Adam. And the head of the woman is the man. So who's the woman? Eve. Now, in, when you read that, that passage there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it makes some startling uh, statements about men and women that cannot be true for anyone other than Adam and Eve. For it says, for the woman, uh, the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man, verse 8. Which, how many women are of the man? Or of any man. Only one ever was of a man. Eve came from Adam, didn't she? That's why uh, in it's the explanation for her name given in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. Adam says, Behold, she shall be called woman. Uh, she is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, for she came out of man. She came out of Eve. She came out of his bosom, out of his side, a rib from Adam, right? That's the story. Now, why is this presented this way? For the angels, we're told. I think it's in, uh, it's in verse 12, 11, 12. Oh, yeah, I should look that. We're not, this is not really, this is kind of a side issue, but... The example is for the benefit of the angels because they were not there to see. In fact, it's so far in the distance past. It was before all things, we're told. Proverbs chapter 8. But they saw because the father said to his son, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so the son made man uh, after his likeness. Male and female made he them. Right? So he, may, he used the same relationship as he and his father had. Being in the form of God. Um, she is the only... She is the only human in all history to have exactly the same DNA as another human. We would be, we would call that what? A clone, yes. She was a clone of Adam, except she was female. That's not an exact clone, is it? Same DNA, but not the same chromosomes, maybe. <laughs> um... She also, the only begotten, so also the only begotten Son of God, we are told, is the only being in all the universe who could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. Great Controversy, page 493. One in nature, in character and purpose. One in nature. The Son had to have exactly the same nature as his Father. Because if you come out of his father, oh, there's another thought of also. We have, I don't know how to draw this, but uh, I'm going to try to make this. What it, let's see. What does that look like? I can put, put snow on it. You know, it's got to be a mountain. And we have, I don't know. We have, oh, let's see. A that should be nice and square, shouldn't it? Cornerstone. And it was in Daniel chapter 2 in this uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, he saw a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. That means if this was a supernatural extraction of this stone. Now, where did the stone come from? From the, mountain. from the mountain. That's right. So it's the same substance as the mountain, right? Exactly the same. 
How old is that stone? Is it as old as the mountain? Mm -hmm. Exactly the same. It is the mountain. And it becomes a mountain. This stone becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth, right? Yes. So long before the Son of Man was born in Bethlehem, we see the Father and the Son in creation of the world also. I mentioned about that. Two persons. But uh, when he comes to this earth, he is a son also. But it's two sonships. One is divine and one is human. The son of God and the son of man. So I me put that in here. <laughs> when he comes to earth, okay, we got the son of God and we have the son of man. And he is both. He has both natures. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul talks about a mystery. This is, this is a mystery to a lot of people. And Galatians, Ephesians, here we go. <clears throat> he says that um, Paul, as a minister, is, it is his <coughs> mission to make all men know uh, to see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So who's the creator? The Father created, right? He created all things. by Jesus Christ, his Son. Now this is very similar to uh, the verse that Frank referred to when we were talking about the divine pattern in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. There is one God, the Father, of whom are all things. He is the source of whom. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. So God created all things by Jesus Christ. The Father is birthed by his wife. Yes, just as Adam is the father of the human race by Eve. And uh, this name Eve does not appear until chapter 3. It's verse 20. And he calls her Eve, for she is the mother of all living, it says. So all come by Eve from Adam, through Adam. Well, the, the parallel is there. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, it says, In these last days God has spoken to us by his Son, by whom he made the worlds, verse 2. So he is the, the Father is the creator by his Son who does the creating. And how does he create? Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Same thing. So he is the word, right? This is another name for the Son of God. He is the word he speaks what his father tells him, gives him commandment to say. And that's also in John chapter 12, uh, verses 49 and 50. He says, I have received commandment of my father what to say and what to speak. The words that I speak are not my words, but the father that speaks in me. John 14, verse 10. Proverbs 8 uh, chapter 8, verse 22 and onwards describes the Lord, Jehovah, all capital, all capital letters there, Yahweh, yud vav he vav It's pronounced all kinds of different ways. 
Proverbs 8, verse 22. The Lord possessed me. And now this whole chapter is talking about wisdom. But who is wisdom? Paul tells us who wisdom is. Here's another name for the son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, he says that Christ, the wisdom of God and the power of God. So this, he, he's talking about the Father, Lord, Jehovah, possessed wisdom. The beginning of his ways, before the, ever the earth was, from everlasting. That reminds you of Micah chapter 5 verse 2. From everlasting. His going forth is, his going forth is from of old, from everlasting. Or as Ellen White liked to choose the marginal reading, from the days of eternity. Now, in these verses in Proverbs chapter 8, if you go down to um, verse 29... It's talking about creation here, isn't it? Uh, when he prepared the heavens and appointed the foundations of the earth. That's creation language. He's building the earth. He's going to build it from the foundation up. He appointed the foundations. And wisdom was there by him, it says. As one brought up with him, verse 30, and daily he was his delight. So the father and son worked together on this. And if you go to chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4, it speaks of the same setting here where they're creating the world together. Who has ascended up to heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? That's almost the same as appointing the foundations of the earth. He appointed the foundations of the earth in, in uh, verse 29 of chapter 8. And here in verse 4 of chapter 30, he says, He has established all the ends of the earth. Now, who did this? He asks. What is his name? Who created all things. What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you can tell? So the father and the son were working together in creation. I believe this is what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 5, verse 17, when he says, Hitherto has my father worked, and I work. They work together in creation. Let us make man in our image and he and he did and the one who established all the ends of the earth who appointed the foundations of the earth has a son that's what Proverbs 30 verse 4 tells us whom he brought forth before the world was chapter 8 so the creator and his son both have a name and it asks us, what is that name? Now, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, it refers to this name. Hebrews chapter 1. And this is talking about the Son, who is appointed heir of all things, in verse 2. And being made so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than the angels. How did he obtain his name? Inherited. He inherited it. Isn't that what sons do? Sons inherit the names of their father. That's how we, you know, the last name carries on through the son. And he inherited his father's name. Now, there's a reference to this in the Old Testament. If you go to uh, Exodus chapter 23, it's after the Ten Commandments and after the statutes, and in verse uh, 20, he says, this is the Lord speaking, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring you into the place where I've prepared. Beware of him, obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Uh, 
I always wondered about it. I got to still figure out why he says he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. The Father's name is in his Son. The angel of the Lord. This is what he, he says, my, an angel here, but if you read down to verse 23, it says, for my angel shall go before you. And if uh, we continue reading through, he talks about my angel, it talks about the angel of the Lord led them. In Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, the angel of the Lord uh, led them and carried them, and redeemed them and saved them. He's a savior. This angel of the Lord is not just any angel. He's an angel that can save, who can redeem who carried them all the days of old. And Paul referred to him in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, and he says that rock that followed them was Christ. He was the one in the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. He was the, referred to as the angel of the Lord. And uh, often I will say the angel of the Lord spoke to the, out of the pillar of fire and he spoke to them. The angel of the Lord came before the door of the tent of the congregation spoke to Moses. The angel of the Lord spoke to him out of the burning bush and said, I am that I am. It's one of the things he said. Well, so in the... That's why 1,500 years later, okay, back here in Exodus chapter 23, he says, my name is in him. Over 1,000 years later, Jesus comes, and he says in John chapter 5, verse 43, I am come in my Father's name, because he has his Father's name in him. Father gave him this name. Colossians chapter, no, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. The Father has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. What name is above every name? The Father's name, because he is above, he is all. He's over all and in all. Right? Ephesians 4, 4, 5. And he comes in his Father's name. That is, the Son that was given unto us, the Son of God, bears the name Jehovah. He has this name. It was given to him. Ellen White makes that same comment. She says, Jehovah is the name given to Christ. His Father's name. And uh, in chapter 10 of John, verse 36 he said, the Father has sanctified me and sent me into the world. And when he said, I am the Son of God, the Jews accused him of blasphemy because they thought he was only a man. But he wasn't just a man. He was the Son of God. He was the divine Son of God who was in the form of God, who inherited everything that his Father had. Uh, Satan questioned his sonship in the wilderness, if you be the son of God. Uh, but the demons, even his own demons knew better. Jesus cast them out and they said, what do, you, what do we have to do with you, thou son of the Most High? You are the son of God, Matthew 8, 29, Luke 8, 28. At his trial, the high priest adjured him by the living God, tell us whether you are the son of God. And the crowd challenged him while he was hanging on the cross. If you be the Son of God, come down. But Mary and Martha knew who Jesus was. When he came, and this is in John chapter 11, he came, and verse 27, he came to raise their brother from the grave. Martha said, you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. The Son of God should come into the world. But there are many today who deny that he was the Son of God who came into the world. 
He wasn't the Son of God until he came into the world. He was the Son of God because he was born of Mary. Oh, well, that's the Son of Man. He was the Son of Man because he was born of Mary, made of a woman. He was the Son of God who the Father sent into the world to save the world. And some... Uh, didn't print out my last page. What I do? Run out of paper? Uh, so I'm going to have to just wing this. But we're about, we're finished here. He is... Somebody's really shooting it up out there, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> I ran out of paper here. Unto us a son is given. That's the final conclusion of the matter. And what kind of a son was given? He is the son of the living God, the confession that Peter made, who has come into this world. He came out of the Father. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 8, they have believed surely that I came out from thee, Father. He's praying to his Father. And have come into this world that he might be the firstborn of many sons. Hebrews chapter 2. We see Jesus. This is verse 9. Oh, let's start verse 6. The Son of Man, made a little lower than the angels. The Son of Man is made a little lower than the angels because he takes on the Word became flesh. John 1 verse 14. He takes on humanity. Crowned with glory and honor. Verse 9, But we see Jesus, made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. Chapter 2, Hebrews 2. Oh, I didn't say 9. Hebrews 2, verse 9. <laughs> 2, verse 9. First of all, he quotes Psalm, chapter 8. Then he says it in his own words again. Why did he become the Son of Man? So that he might die. Because the Son of God and divinity couldn't die. He became the Son of Man, right here in verse 10, for the suffering of death, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. But who was it that died? The Son of God. It was, the, it was our sinful nature, our sinful human nature, with all the sins of the world. Isn't that what they said? He bore all the sins of the world. Uh, well, it's, it's John's commentary. In the end of chapter 11, John 11, you remember the high priest Caiaphas said, it is better that one man should perish than the whole nation. And he said this, not knowing that Jesus, Jesus should die for all the sins of the world. He took all those sins in his own body, on the tree, as Peter says, and took that to the second death. But who died was the Son of God? Well, yeah, I think he's both. There's, that's, another, that's another study. <laughs> and is Satan, Satan, go, is he going to take all of, is he going to be responsible for all of it? Yes, that too. And it's not one or the other. Many of these cases, there's, you can see it from different angles. But he is the Son of God and the Son of Man. And he is given to us. Unto us a son is given. 
With that thought, let us close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for the unspeakable gift of your Son. It will be the study of your children throughout all eternity. You've given us many, many precious passages of Scripture that tell of your great love in giving yourself the son of your body that came out of you. We thank you for this gift that makes it possible in him coming and taking our nature that we may share that divine nature with him. As his children, you have adopted us as your children. And we thank you for giving us this great love to dwell in our hearts through his spirit. We pray this in his name. Amen. And we have Truly our fellowship is with our Father and